very good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and uh, i think after this sumptuous lunch we have got uh, some great food for thought because we have a great set of panelists with us who are going to discuss about uh, the new set of investors who are uh, emerging in the indian market so before we get into the discussion mode i'll give 30 seconds to each of the speaker to quickly introduce themselves before we get into the discussion mode i'll start with you ivy sure thanks uh, my name is ivy i'm a partner with inflection point ventures we're one of the largest angel investing platforms in india uh, started in 2018 and today we run a portfolio of about 190 uh, startups thank you uh, this is rohit i'm a partner with weh ventures we are a pre seed and seed stage focused fund we've been around since 2017 we are done with uh, two funds we are on to our third fund right now and uh, we invest in about 20 companies per fund and we support them from the early stage till series a yeah uh, my name is neeraj and uh, i am the co-founder of ceo of uh, we found a circle we have uh, two angel fund one for india and one for cross border uh, which is very unique and uh, we recently launched a vc fund also it's a 60 million dollar fund so put together three funds uh, around 80 billion dollars of committed capital we invested in uh, 130 startups in last 3 years across sectors early stage that's uh, that's basically uh, our forte um our thesis is very simple founders first uh, good market basic hygiene is there i think we are happy to back the company so yeah uh, very happy at the presence of all of my colleagues here thank you uh, hi uh, sorry <coughs> sorry My name is Anand. I'm a partner at a firm called as Bessemer Venture Partners (BVP). Uh, we've been investing uh, globally since 1911. Started out in India in 2006. Focus on four key sectors: uh, consumer internet, fintech software, health tech, uh, health tech software, and global SaaS being built from India for the world. I spend a lot of my time on uh, SaaS and consumer tech. Uh, we mostly do Series A, B, C. So typically post. Uh, pmf investing so maybe you know a stage ahead of you know where some of you know the other folks come in uh and yeah uh, you know really excited for the panel and thanks for having uh, me here yeah hi uh, my name is ashwin raghuraman i'm the co-founder and partner at the bharat innovation fund um, <laughs> fantastic to be here so thanks for having me uh we invest predominantly in the pre a and series a rounds of deep tech startups that are building from india but for global markets and um, we have a portfolio of about 23 companies now kicked off this fund in 2018 and i've been investing since 2010 thank you so i'm going to start with you iv first uh, i mean uh, because you already have a, a big angel pool with you so when we talk about the expanding investor pool uh, apart from cxos and professionals what kind of uh, i mean uh, people have been actually joining the angel ecosystem lately sure i think maybe to step back is to think about the fact that we've always uh, sort of the image of an angel investor is someone who's either been an ex founder uh, and has sort of created wealth already uh, as part of the ecosystem and therefore contributing back Uh, when ipv started the intent was to say that as an asset class uh, startups are therefore available and an option for across the board anyone who's looking to build out a portfolio of assets and therefore our first members were actually cxos so i think that continues for us as a theme uh, sort of professionals who are in corporate jobs so to speak but then accessing this to add to their overall uh, you know wealth building uh, portfolio uh, in that while we talk about that i think there is of course the tiering from locations but i think we've seen uh, and we are about uh, 12000 plus members uh, we see our members coming in across 45 countries but then within india as well uh, across cities and depth there as well okay sure Rohit, coming to you. I mean, uh, do you think uh, the investor pool is further expanding in the Indian market? And somebody who is now uh, looking at uh, becoming an investor in the India sphere, I mean, how should they look at it? No, see, um, you know, if you compare twenty seventeen to now, I think the overall base has changed significantly. So we are a ninety five percent domestic fund. So we've raised all the capital from LPs in India, and um, I think it's gotten much easier to raise capital. thanks to everything that's happening in the ecosystem but more importantly if you see 
um, I think we crossed 50% penetration in internet for the first time last year. Whereas China crossed it in 2015 and US crossed it in 20, 2001. So I think now is when it's a great time to enter and a lot of people are realizing that um, in spite of the boom and bust or whatever funding winter, we are still seeing a lot of interest um, even from places like Coimbatore and Karur in Tamil Nadu or uh, Gandhi Dam in Gujarat, uh, not even Ahmedabad, right? Like even smaller cities. Um, and these have been inbound interest people reaching out to us saying we want to invest in the ecosystem. Uh, and I think this is going to get uh, better over the next few years. And as a domestic capital strengthens, I think we will be self-reliant in terms of funding the company from an early stage to even a series B or C. So that's, that's, that's at least my viewpoint on this. Meeraj, coming to you, uh, do you see any new set of investors coming in? Yeah, definitely. Um, across all sectors, all kind of demographic, I think there is a general increase in number of people like who are interested to know this asset class. So that's a very healthy sign that it's not one particular sector like which is driving the, uh, the ecosystem as such. But if I want to highlight two uh, very interesting and healthy signs, uh, one is the tier 2, 3, 4 ecosystem which uh, they also mention. Uh, that is like bottom of the pyramid, a lot of new people are coming in okay, from that uh, region and it's very good for the community because they bring a very diverse lens of investing, their motivation is very different. Um, in urban cities, probably I think people are more driven with the multiple of the money that they invest. Uh, in those cities, I think it's also the opportunity to understand the new business models and probably digitally transform their own businesses. So I may be a hospital owner or I'd say school, college, university or I'm a trader or I'm a manufacturer or logistics supply player in okay, a small town. I think for me, there is no way I can get into the tech circle. Probably investing in startup and through that, uh, I can make some inroads, I can, I can get access to some of the technology solutions and that becomes a very big motivation for these guys. So they come with a very strategic outcome. So that's what we have seen. Second is the Indian diaspora outside India. Okay? A huge population of people who are, especially in global startup cities like Singapore and Hong Kong and Dubai and London, uh, they have always been, I think, well exposed to this asset class. For them, the challenge was different. Okay, It was a challenge of how to invest in Indian ecosystem because there was no fund structure as such. So I think these were two areas that we identified okay, in my initial like first five years when I started in 2015-16. And um, as an organization, we worked on these two okay, part. And um, I'm very happy to say that one, we are the only cross-border um, angel fund today. So we can br bring in small checks of $5,000, $10,000 in any company in India across the world. And similarly, we can pull in uh, Indian money and invest anywhere in the world. So it's like outward, inward mobility of funding and that is allowing a lot of cross-border investments now. So these are the two very highlighting fact that I can talk about from my journey that one is the rise of tier 2, 3, 4 and second is the global diaspora coming very actively participating in Indian ecosystem. So this uh, put together, if I tell you, uh, in our community, there are like 13,000 investors, okay? We have created an angel list kind of a platform also. So, which is again a way to connect the community, both in, in India and outside India. So, imagine 13,000 people are there on that platform and only 3,000 of them have invested till now, by the way, okay? So, just to tell you that there is a huge level of curiosity. If you have some kind of a very meaningful way to engage them, then I think there is great inflow of new people okay, coming in and joining the ecosystem as such. Yeah. Sure. Anand, coming to you, I mean, uh, how international LPs are looking at the Indian market? How excited are they in the current macroeconomic environment? Yeah, I think they're very excited. Uh, you know, if you look at what's happening globally, you know, uh, like if you look at the top five or six global economies, so India is now number four, uh, you know, it's going to be the third largest economy soon as well. So if you are a global investor, you want to be in the top three, four, five economies. Mm -hmm. And if you leave out the US, uh, you know, the next one is China. It's not, you know, last few months, years haven't been great for investors in that geography. Um, and, uh, and so India kind of is the fastest growing, rapidly rising, soon to be number three largest economy, which is easily accessible. Um, also, uh, you know, the other things happening in the world, there's political conflict, there's dispute. 
you know there's uh, there's you know geopolitical conflict going on there's economic uh, you know tariff wars going on um, and in that kind of uh, macro environment india is like this growing emerging economy you know not not embroiled in any of those kind of conflicts not embroiled in any tariff wars and is a relatively uh, you know stable place for global capital looking to invest in emerging economies um, plus if you look at how the you know i think the report on the growth of gdp came out some 7.5 7.6% growth you know which came out which is again you know very positive stock markets have been doing well again which is very contraindicative to if you look at stock markets across the world indian you know the indian index has outperformed over the past 3 4 years so if you look at all those factors and you know uh, in you know together uh, for a global lp you know these are the things that they that they see and then you have this thriving ecosystem of you know you know the stuff that was talked about of you know more and more investors domestically looking to do seed rounds angel rounds you know angel platforms coming up you know uh, you know folks who are looking to fund grassroots level innovation so you have early stage capital you have a stable economy and you have folks who want to move capital away from other economies which are not great so india is in a good position you know touch wood i would say right now and i think it's uh, you know it's up to us to make the most of this opportunity as as investors entrepreneurs folks in the ecosystem sure. ashwin coming to you uh, i mean uh, how is your opinion about uh, the expanding investor pool in india and uh, how Uh, the lps are looking at it do you see more from the domestic capital coming in or more funds from the outside yeah i think i always say it's it's not a it's the best time to be a founder in india if you think of the last 14 15 years i haven't uh, seen a better time to be a founder because there's just so many sources of capital there's so much uh, capital at so many different stages right and while it may not be enough to support all the entrepreneurial activity it's still the best uh, it's still the easiest to raise in today's world uh, compared to maybe 5 10 years back right um if we think of sources of capital i do think it's increased on multiple fronts uh, ours is a fairly nascent vc ecosystem in india and we are at a you know growing at a clip right a rate of knots and uh, that's that means that there's a lot of capital coming in from different sources existing sources as well as new sources i think the existing ones have you know double down capital from institutions in india for example uh, has gone up but broadly we have predominantly been or, or the capital in india and the vc p space has been dominated by international capital over the last couple of decades at least and beyond and it remains that way um where the domestic capital flow has perhaps improved is institutions in india are investing in india you have the rise of family offices mm -hmm. who are now coming into india and this is as recent as 3 or 4 years starting to invest both both directly as well as into funds directly in startups as well as into funds and you have this uh, other set of capital which perhaps you know from international sources or lps which is slightly different from what our blue blooded funds have been raising outside right which is endowments and so on uh, we do have a newer set of capital which is from other geos which had been flowing into china for ever so long and now when you talk to them they tell you that listen india is looking pretty much like how china was looking 15 years or 20 years back and so they want to figure out how to play in the indian market of course there's a big learning curve to india there's a lot of differences with china or any other geo which they are a little bit wary of but i think they are very interested in looking to find a way to be a part of i mean very clearly there's a global buzz as to what's happening in the startup ecosystem in india and people are trying to figure out how to then be a part of this we are also talking about uh, the increasing level of investments in the indian market and uh, how uh, enough money is available you just need to be at the right place at the right time talking to the right people and uh, that's where our audience would further like to know uh, that when they are considering investment i mean uh, what should they consider they shall they shall they go to a family office shall they consider venture debt venture capital i mean uh, in early stage which fund they would go to so if you could all just uh, brief it about uh, the areas where you are investing in 
what kind of investments have been happening lately and the focus areas which each of you have at the moment? Um, for Inflection Point Ventures, we are of course, uh, I would say sector agnostic, uh, but largely uh, early stage, though we do participate right up to even Series A as well. Uh, maybe the question if as a founder who do I go to uh, it does depend on stage uh, I think while we've talked about family offices etc uh, we're also thinking about time and effort that founders then need to spend right uh, the more organized family offices would probably have something out there but then easiest to reach out would be uh, platforms because they we ourselves as platforms are out there, right? Um, then of course, the VCs, depending on st stage and sector, there's a bit of homework that founders will need to do uh, to make sure that their efforts and time spent well. But as a fund, and we of course at IPB, we do have our category two uh, VC fund as well, FISIS, which looks at series A, series B. Uh, with that said, um, I think for us will always be founders, what problem we're setting out to solve, right? And then, yeah, we take it from there. See, we invest at the pre-seed and seed stage, right? But um, even within that, the kind of founders that we back is something that we call emerging founders. Basically, these are not serial entrepreneurs. These are entrepreneurs starting up for the first time. And usually, they have about three to four years of work experience, ideally in a startup previously. And what we've seen is they struggle to raise the first or the second round of capital, beyond which there is traction, there is product, and then, you know, there are a lot of proof points, uh, basis which VCs can come in. And I think this is a gap that we've been sort of investing in uh, since our first fund. Um, and even if some of the better names, if you look at it now that we've invested in like small case or a jar or uh, Shri Mandir or Unbox Robotics, these were all founders which were struggling a lot to actually raise their pre-seed or seed round. And I think there is a gap here, irrespective of how much capital is actually flowing around. And um, you do need focused sort of players at this stage, which can back the entrepreneurs and get them to a series A, beyond which it's actually there is a lot of data points and um, monetization that is possible and probably um, good signs of PMF. Um, so I think this is where we play in and we're agnostic, right? Across all sectors we invest in and easiest way to reach out to funds most likely is through um, referrals from other portfolio companies. I think that is the best way where you definitely get a call beyond which, of course, right? I think each of us have our own preferences which we invest in. Yeah, uh, pretty much uh, uh, the same thing. Uh, See, early stage, if you are investing in early stage, uh, and especially if you are doing it through the angel fund and network, uh, it's, it works in your favor if you are sector agnostic, okay? Because then uh, uh, that's how I think you can attract more diverse set of investors also. Uh, because angel investors, uh, they don't have thesis as, as in like a VC. Uh, so, and you are, you are trying to serve a large Okay, a set of pool of investors. So it's always good to have a sector agnostic approach. But what we have seen is like, for example, we started with the angel okay, um, checks, uh, first institutional checks, somewhere in the range of 250K to upwards of $1 million. But then we realized that we are losing on some of the very, very good founders who had just started. So they were not a revenue company. They were just at the idea stage and pre-revenue. So we thought, can we just have a separate program, a separate institutional, okay, a tool to invest in these companies. So we, we set up a accelerator program and last year we invested 25 such basically companies, okay. That is balance sheet investing that we are doing right now. And on the other side of the spectrum is uh, where we thought we need to have a VC fund of our own because now the portfolio is growing so much and some of our uh, series A, series B companies are, are attracting a lot of good capital from outside. So we thought we should also get leverage of this fact because our angels want to exit at that stage, okay, when Series A and B are happening. But as an institution, we thought, why can't we just keep on uh, investing in these, uh, say, some of the like marquee winners of our portfolio companies? And that's why uh, the, 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 we launched the VC fund. So if you see this today, we have all stage investing as far as early stage is concerned. So right from pre seed, we have accelerator program, middle, we have angel, and now the VC fund. Um, so zero to five years up. So that's uh, where we are helping the founders to invest. As far as sectors are concerned, I think we have not done anything um, consciously, but 
uh, while investing, there are a few sectors where we have now very good portfolio companies and there is network effect and some kind of like knowledge base and thesis that we have developed. So, uh, sectors like uh, EV, we were very bullish on five years back and there was no VC who were investing in that sector. Okay, Today also there is very so much of a struggle actually despite all the buzz around uh, EV and climate tech. Uh, and then a uh, lot of like fintech, uh, very good success stories we had. Um, around AI and deep tech, which was not our forte, but of late in last 12 months, we have done a lot of uh, very aggressive investing in these uh, sectors also. So for us, I think uh, climate tech, agri tech, AI, and uh, deep tech, these are like four or five sectors where we are very bullish uh, and we will keep on investing in these sectors. You know. sure. Anand? Yeah, I think, <coughs> you know, as a firm, our, uh, we are not so focused on the seed and the pre-seed stage, so I'm probably not the best person to comment on this. But I think everything you know that has been said, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I think the only thing I would add more from a first principles perspective is there's a lot of angel platforms, family office platforms, seed firms in India, like, and a basic Google search in 10 minutes will give you a list of like 50 of such things. Um, having your, you know, whatever pitch deck, presentation, memo, whatever it is, ready and be able to write a customized email to all these folks. I think that's that's honestly like, like if you do that diligently, my my experience is that most people reply, you know, because this is our job, uh, you know, so so I get this, uh, this you know, I get asked this a lot that, you know, you have this email ID called India at bvp.com and uh, do you read that? And the fact is we read every email that comes there. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's interesting, we will reply. If it's not interesting, we will not reply because, you know, you can't reply to a thousand emails yeah. saying, no, thank you, no, thank you. But the fact is we are reading them and every single one of those is actually read. And if it's interesting and if it fits the funds thesis, you know, because, you know, that's our job. So I think uh, the thing that, you know, often founders, you know, and especially, early, you know, like the new founders, as was talked about, they feel that unless they have a warm connect, unless they have a, you know, reference, it's not worth reaching out. I would say that's not the case to reach out because we are all in this to find really interesting companies. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I know that uh, Bharat Innovation Fund does a lot of early stage and a lot of deep tech. So I let, I let Ashwin talk a little bit more about this. Um, yeah, I think there are two questions in there, right? What do the founders or where do the founders go and then what do we do, right? And as I mentioned earlier, we are a deep tech focused fund. We are fairly vertical agnostic. I can't say sector agnostic anymore because people equate deep tech with the sector these days, right? Uh, but, and then people ask us, what is deep tech? And we've been trying to explain that as well, right? Uh, obviously, we're looking for a serious amount of IP. Uh, but more importantly, having a technology moat, which then means that you have a strong defense, um, a little bit of a product first approach, because other things like team and uh, becomes hygiene and market opportunity is something very often that gets developed when you think of cutting edge technology, right? So there isn't a market that you parachute into. And so it, we, we think of a little bit of a product first approach where market creation can happen as well or could happen or an existing market gets or market players get disrupted. Uh, but if I were to think about breaking it up even further, when we think deep tech, we actually think of three buckets. Uh, our first bucket is a little bit more what we call advanced software or AI driven startups and we are sort of navigating to coining the term advanced SaaS to differentiate from the what we call plain vanilla SaaS which has been around and doing well and SaaS boomy just happened uh, last week in Chennai. So we know many companies have or startups have matured there but I think the AI SaaS startups is the new breed of startups that will emerge from India and we want to support those. The second bucket is a little bit of a hardware software mix bucket. Uh, where we see embedded systems or a hardware product. Uh, hard to find later stage capital there, but we do think the, there are a few that stand out and do extremely well. Attenberg being an example of a company we look closely at, which has just scaled up massively. And there are a few other names like that as well. The third bucket, which is harder, and which is where we are, to put it politely, we are being courageous, uh, hopefully courageous and not foolish, is the whole biotech, bioscience uh, side of things. And we've invested in companies, for example, a company that is creating or developing a drug for cancer a discovery company, a company in the intraocular lens space with an innovative material and so on, right? We have three or four investments in that space. And I think those are the third flavor of deep tech startups that we 
typically invest in. Now, getting to your other uh, question on where do the founders go, I think it's horses for courses. That's the important part, right? I think I agree with everything else that was said. Just to add, um, you know, there's, there's various stages. And you may even start with a government grant or a foundation grant when, if you're creating, let's say, a healthcare startup right at the early stages. A uh, few incubators today are putting in a small amount of capital. You could start there, move from that to early stage, angels, angel networks. Now there's a bunch of micro VC funds yeah. that have emerged, early stage VC later on and so on, right? So there's a fair, I mean, the, the entire uh, range is there. And I think it's important at some point of time to figure out what type of capital. Okay, first figure out, do you want capital? I think to the founder, that's the first question. Do you want VC capital is a very quest, very important question to answer because it's a very different pathway than if you were to be a bootstrap entrepreneur, who were to build a quote-unquote a lifestyle business, right? And you want to do it on your own. So that's question one. But subsequently, I think there are, you know, who's the right fund for you? Uh, who's got the expertise, who's got the ability to help beyond capital is something that you can look at. And there will be a few that will fit that better than the others. And finally, I mean, maybe you start with those first and then go to the, the rest of them. I think finally, I just want to end by saying, I mean, at the end of the day, it's perspective, right? We were just talking before the panel, Anant and I are together in the same company, but he doesn't have deep tech on the Bessemer. Uh, I mean, it's not a category, right? Uh, so, a company that I might have invested in 2018, which was a deep tech AI company, has now become a SaaS company, enterprise SaaS, and fits well into the pieces of Bessemer and a few others, right? So, companies also evolve. Some of these categories are a little bit fungible uh, in a sense, and we need to be cognizant of that when we're thinking of, you know, who we're looking to invest in us or how we're looking at the startup world. Uh, Anand, if you could also add uh, any particular anecdote wherein you would have supported any founder in their journey of late and uh, I mean, uh, how has been the experience like with an entrepreneur and investor? Because it's a dynamic world. For an entrepreneur, the world is changing every day and the kind of environment we are looking in right now. So I want to understand as an investor, if you've supported them at any, partic at any particular stage, any anecdote you could share from your experience. Uh, you've put me on the spot here. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, so I think, you know, uh, so two parts to that. How do we, you know, how do investors typically support founders and then what do we do and then I can give you an example to illustrate that. See, uh, the most important thing that your investor has to do is to give you money, right? Uh, anything that happens on top of that, at least, you know, in my opinion is, is gravy. Make sure that they have the funds to wire the money to you. Because we hear a lot of stories of people, you know, committing but not really wiring money. Uh, so the most important thing is that the money is there when somebody said that we're going to invest, the money reaches your bank account, great. I think the next thing is you need to know what you need from your investor. Because at the end of the day, and, and we have this terminology internally, we are, we are just invited guests. You know, it's your, it's your journey, it's your, you know, you know, dream that you're building out, it's your... You know, you're running it. You're in the driver's seat. We are invited guests. You have allowed us to be on that seat. We can, we can tell you stuff if you ask us. But if you think that we are going to run the company for you, we are going to tell you do this, do that. That is not a great place to be in. Like if I thought I could, if I knew better than any of my founders, I would go start that business. Uh, the reason I'm investing in that founder is because I know they understand this. There are specific areas, for example, you know, oh, you are negotiating a contract and there is a term that some, that the customer threw at you, which you never saw before. That's something you can go and ask your investor that, hey, you know, what does this clause mean? Have you seen this? Have any of your other companies seen this? And very, you know, very transparently, the chances that your investor has seen that term are low, but the chances that one of his or her other portfolio companies have encountered that term and two or three of them have taken two or three different approaches to do it and there is a like so basically the investor is just collating data for for you from sources that you may not have access to and relaying back to you so understanding that is also important so that your expectations are aligned uh, so you should know what you are going to ask like if you ask them what product feature should i build don't ask that to your investor you'll probably get the wrong answer but hey 
I am interviewing this candidate, they are in the last round of the interview, they spent three years at their last firm, can you help me do a ref check? Yes, that probably we can help because we have a vast network. Now how do we specifically do this? So we have like, you know, I am sure every firm has this but we have a huge kind of platform and portfolio uh, support team, you know, there is almost 50 uh, industry executives who are what we call as operating advisors, these are folks who have built and scaled large businesses, they have operated, they are available, uh, you know, when someone has a question, they are available, you know, for a consultation, of course, it's, I mean, there is no charges or anything for that for the founders. Um, you know, we have the entire portfolio network and given we are a global firm, that network is fairly global. So even if you are a uh, AI company in India, we can connect you to a AI leader in the Bay Area because they are in our portfolio. And specifically, you know, maybe given Ashwin has already kind of brought out, you know, so we are both, uh, you know, we are both investors in this company called as uh, Entropic, which uh, coincidentally, I don't know if you saw Ashwin on that WhatsApp group, they have been named the AI startup of the year. I think by by entrepreneur or like, I think some magazine, I don't know which one yesterday. Price, price yeah, yeah. So, so now they had a very interesting problem. They were using a lot of, uh, so they were tuning a lot of open source LLMs uh, using, you know, uh, using inputs from OpenAI, from uh, Anthropic, from many other places. And they weren't getting as much. Uh, so because everyone wants LLMs, everyone wants GPUs, there is a throttling that is happening. So. Anthropic or, or an open AI or someone else is not letting anyone ping their APIs. They are kind of putting like, uh, you know, uh, a toll gate which is higher for other people. So now he was like, hey, I need this. They have released this in private beta to a few founders globally. I know that. Do you know somebody in Anthropic? And I think in a week's time, we were able to find the right people. We connected the CTO of Entropic to Anthropic. Yes, they sound similar, but they are different companies. Uh, and uh, and I think they got that access and now, now that is something which is a good, you know, like I think that's a great example and then, you know, we are recently, we are interviewing a very senior candidate in the firm and, you know, he was like, hey, can you give your inputs, I have these, you know, two or three doubts, I'm not sure how to evaluate this. So I think that's the kind of ways in which we, we help. That's a long winded answer to your, to your question but hopefully it gives a little bit of color. Okay, okay, sure. Uh, talking at the Tech and Innovation Summit, and uh, there's a saying which is going on that uh, if you have you're, you're building an AI ecosystem, it can certainly open the gates to a lot of investors. But I want to understand uh, what are the new technology areas wherein you are looking to invest, new segments which you think would be exciting enough for you to invest in in the coming times. So, uh, Ashwin, you want to comment? Uh, I think new tech areas. Uh, I mean, if you really think about it, I keep saying we've hardly scratched the surface with AI. There's just so many use cases, right? I mean, leave aside Gen AI, even with conventional AI, computer vision and so on. I think uh, we've hardly scratched the surface. So we, we think there's so many more application areas in AI that you get addressed across sectors, be it healthcare, be it supply chain, be it uh, marketing, be it agri-tech, you know, it's just it's just going to touch a bunch of things and there's a lot of headroom there. I think the second one which is, uh, and we've been investing in anything which is emerging tech, but I think the one that we have looked at very, very uh, sort of briefly, if I may put it that way, but we think there's a lot of promise in the years to come is really materials. Uh, we think that there's a lot of action happening globally on the materials side. Uh, there is action starting in India because of the EV space. So there's a lot of startups that are trying to build battery technology and so on. But I think if I just think about even one of our startups, which is used a new material to create a world-class intraocular lens and are being sought after now by multi-billion dollar conglomerates, which have been in the space. I think there's, and that, and the multiple or the myriad of use cases you can have with newer materials is also massive. So we think that that is something given our, let's say, scientific temper as well in India. We may start seeing more and more startups. So we are keeping a close watch on that space. But these are two extremes, AI materials, and there's so much in, in, in between that it will take me a long time to talk about it. So I just thought I'll focus on these two. Sure. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, for us, uh, 
at least my own and our view is that AI is a new way of building software. Like it's just like I don't think there is an AI company or a software company. It's like when when cloud happened, uh, you know, software development embraced the cloud. You know, like you, like it's, it's a it's a fundamentally new way of building software. <laughs> And if you're building any software company today, you have to, you're probably using AI somewhere. And if you're not, you should think about it because your competitors definitely will. And even if you're not building a software company, and I was actually asked this question at a conference where I kind of went and said that pretty much every business will change some of its functional, uh, you know, ways of uh, working because of AI. And then somebody raised their hand and said, I don't agree. How will a plumber change how their business works? And I couldn't answer that question at that time, but then I thought about it. The fact is that even if you're a person who has nothing to do with technology, you still need customers and you need, you know, suppliers. Like eventually every business or service has some customers. How you engage with that customers is fundamentally changing through AI. You know, you don't need to talk like, like there are certain, you know, ways in which you can better uh, kind of manage those conversations. You can filter your leads better. You can schedule your, you know, trips better. So. There are many ways in which AI is changing everything that we are doing. So, A, it's important to identify, is your business one where AI is a functional addition, it improves your functions or is your business where AI fundamentally changes the business? One of those two will be true. And if it fundamentally changes, you know, the business, then you should think about what has changed, which, you know, what is now possible that wasn't possible three years ago. And if you're a business which is like, oh, you know, it doesn't like, you know, I'm a, I own a, I'm running a grocery store, you know, AI doesn't change that much for me functionally, well, you know, sorry, like fundamentally, but functionally, can I do better pricing through AI? Can I better retarget customers who walk in? Can I send them better customized messages? So thinking about where, like one of those two things will be true. Uh, I can't think of, again, I will say that because I, I said last time somebody came up with, but I would like to be challenged on this. I don't think there is any business that will not be changed by AI. Even if it's a coal plant, somebody asked me about a coal plant, coal plant, the temperature at which you maintain the furnaces can actually be now modulated using AI, which will reduce wastage, improve, you know, production. So pretty much every business get, can get changed. I, I did want to add to that. I think uh, probably for us as investors, but I think simply as consumers ourselves and maybe patients as well, but uh, anything in terms of maybe deep tech for technology, right? Uh, a lot of low hanging fruit has been touched, you know, digitization of hospitals, uh, telemedicine, etc. But I think the next level of change in health tech, which is either, uh, I would say opening up access uh, or driving efficiency, efficacy of treatment, whether it is through medical devices, whether it is to drugs, that's an area of interest for us. But like I was chatting with someone else as well, right? Given that this is, truly startup, right? Unknown, high risk, long gestation. Uh, how do we as investors really think about it? And I, I would say our evaluation of that is something that we challenge ourselves on for an area. Yeah, uh, so I think they very uh, clearly at least defined one thing for all of us is that AI yeah, itself is not one sector as such, okay? It's underlying technology and which are multiple use cases. So. We are looking at it, okay, from that lens. So whether it is banking or agri or logistics, healthcare, everywhere you can find very, very interesting use cases from the AI lens. And I think that's where most of the investment is going. But I think on the other side, in terms of uh, any business which is addressing the consumption, okay, uh, making uh, more target audience inclusive in the in the business. So on the financial inclusion side, I think on the healthcare inclusion side, Whatever technology, whatever solutions we are talking about in the urban cities has not reached to tier 2, 3, 4, okay? Forget about tier 3, 4. It's not even reached to the tier 2. So there's a huge opportunity for all those businesses which are not innovation driven, but which are execution driven. I think for them also, there's a huge market potential right now also to create. So for example, there is a, there is a company which is not doing anything special in our portfolio called Ayush Pay. What they've done is that they've created a health card which gives you almost like 50,000 uh, rupees worth of medical benefit including the insurance and they are taking it to a very different mass level uh, distribution. So I think there, there is nothing new about what they are doing. But eventually where they will lead is if they have a large inclusion of people into the 
digital healthcare framework, then the data itself will basically become a value that will play after say maybe two years down the line. So today they are more seen like a distribution company. I think after two years, uh, parallelly they are building a AI layer where they they will be using this data for multiple use cases for drug discovery, for drug distribution, for any health uh, medical healthcare. Uh, distribution point of view. I think those things can be done and uh, that's where we are very bullish that in case somebody is trying to give reach to the solutions, I think those kind of businesses are very, very interesting for us. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think the lot's been spoken about AI and I think that's obviously a great opportunity. But personally, I'm also excited about ONDC, right? Because if you see B2B, B2C platforms, marketplaces, so many have been built and scaled. But now you're slowly seeing that they can be disrupted as well, right? Thanks to what Namayatri has been able to do in Bangalore. That's a great example because they built this with a team of less than 20 people. Um, physicists, Uber and Ola, hundreds of engineers work on the product. This is a great example. I think this is motivating founders in a lot of other sectors to take up because the opportunity set is actually very, very large. If you can disrupt a Zomato or a Swiggy or a, or even some of these newer B2B marketplaces which have emerged. And like Anand said, using AI to build software brings down the cost. So you can do it very, very efficiently uh, with a much, much smaller team size. So therefore, your end goal of raising hundreds of millions of dollars of venture to do it might not be necessary. Even with two, three rounds of funding, you can sort of achieve what the larger companies have achieved over the last 10 years. So this is a interesting sector that we've been trying to focus on. We've not invested in anything yet, but we're actively looking at it. Sure. So on that note, we open the floor for questions. Please raise your hand, identify yourself. The mic will be passed on to you. Can we pass on the mic to the lady there? Thank you. Sorry, I feel like I'm asking all the questions. If someone else has a question, please. My name is Tia. I'm from Australia. I'm here researching the entrepreneurial ecosystem, specifically around investments. I'm curious, as the topic of the uh, session is about expanding the investor pool, I'm wondering how the different types of investors or the expansion of the investor pool, how that's had an influence on whether the way that you do capital, the sectors that you're looking at, or just in general, how that has an influence on the way that you are currently operating. I mean, just to quickly answer your question, it has not affected us directly or indirectly in any way. Um, I think uh, it's capital is always welcome and it's helpful, but that's not necessarily directly affected the kind of sectors that we invest in or the check sizes or even the kind of instruments that we invest in. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe I can, uh, you know, I think we've talked a lot about the private investment sector. I think one, thing that we didn't touch upon is the capital that is available in public markets today. You know, if you look at how the domestic fund flows in the Indian public markets have changed over the last few years, there's almost been a three to four X growth in the last nine, 10 years. I mean, so like it's been a phenomenal growth and that has happened on the back of basically two things. One is as disposable income increases and India moves from a savings driven population to an investment driven population you're seeing more inflow into into like, you know, outside of just fixed deposits into the public equities market. Second, because of uh, regulation, uh, pension funds, uh, which were, or, you know, national insurance companies, which were earlier not allowed to invest in the public equities have now been over, you know, past few years that, you know, it was earlier, you can't invest and it was like some 1%, 3%, whatever, that number has been going up. So you have this flow of, retail investors usually investing through what in India is called as a SIP systematic investment plans, which is like monthly you invest 5,000 rupees, 1,000 rupees, 500 rupees, which is the equivalent of 10, 20, 30, 40 dollars. Plus you have these insurance slash pension fund corpuses, which are now available. So the domestic capital has come in and the way this is best seen is historically, whenever there has been a global financial pullback, you know, the minute the foreign investors leave Indian stock markets crashed. Uh, you look at what happened in 2001, look at what happened in 2008, uh, every single time, you know, the global markets would crash and markets would crash. But in the last three years, even the global markets actually declined a lot. The Indian markets did not because majority of the capital is now domestic. 
they are not pulling in and pulling out because of you know interest rates and that these are indian customers indian retail you know kind of investors indian insurance companies pension funds who are want, who are long on the india story and because that capital is increasing because the public market has more capital available to it there is a higher likelihood or there is you know the the ease of going public has become higher and more companies can think of an ipo journey and we are seeing that as more and more companies try to make ipo their you know preferred option and we are hearing stories of or at least news of companies which had earlier to domiciled in the us trying to go public in the us and now trying to flip back to india to go public in the indian market because it's just a better place so i think that's one place where i directly see how increased source of capital has <coughs> helped but i'll let ashwin come in as well yeah, do i have a minute to take that i know i'll quickly uh, answer it from our perspective i mean given we are a deep tech focused fund and we invest early stage gestation periods are fairly large right and time to exit is a little bit longer perhaps than some of you know our counterparts here and and therefore our capital pools are the ones available to us today uh versus maybe your choice of capital pool uh and patient capital being available to us as funds is something that we've not yet managed to match the way we would want to right and as a result we do have lp pressures who say hey listen maybe we should be thinking about distributing exits and so on and so forth in a space where we typically need a lot more time and if you think of some of the great global funds besma included i think their life cycles and fund cycles are much larger sequoia did that maybe a couple of years back where they did this evergreen fund and so on and so they have to a certain extent correct me if i'm wrong the luxury of a little bit longer to drive those exits because there's less pressure because of the nature of their capital pools and for us i think that's something that we need to or or all of us as funds we need to realize that it does take time to build startups to scale and if while we do hand over for example we invest early stage and then somebody else comes in we want them to you know really take ownership of that company as an investor forward but we still like to stay invested in the company till it has really scaled and sometimes the exit pressure based on capital pools that we have uh, coming into us force our hand when we would have rather stayed in a company rather than exit so on that note we would like to conclude the session as we have to begin the next one and uh, i thank all the panelists out here for coming in and uh, sharing your perspective and all the insights about the industry thank you so much thank you.